started my new job at Union Pacific Railroad about 10 years ago, I was really excited to be a user experience specialist. I joined my new project team. They were working on a legacy system. I joined my new project team. They were working on a legacy system. And I was really excited to infuse all this great user experience knowledge into this talk and this project. So I met my project team and I had a very stoic project manager who had no idea why I was on this project. Never worked with a user experience person before. And I was working on a, a legacy system that was both loved and hated. Very love-hate relationship with both its users and its developers, command line system. And when I started talking about all the different things I'd learned in school, all the user research techniques and Fitz Law and Nielsen's heuristics, they would glaze over. I just want you to put a radio button here. Why is that so hard? And I realized I wasn't speaking the same language as them. And I needed to reevaluate my approach and speak a common language with everybody. And that's when I discovered storytelling. So, <laughs> Wait, talking about a story about storytelling and a storytelling talk, that am, that I am, it's very, very meta. But before we get too far, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Ash. As I said, I'm a user experience advocate. I about 10 years experience in uh, user research, user uh, usability, testing, design, all that fun stuff. And I'm also kind of a big deal in the tech speaking circuits. I'm sure you've all heard of me. Um, I actually really like to compete for humorous and storytelling and that sort of thing as a Toastmaster. And one of the things that I really like to do is coach people and get them to how to be better speakers and be better presenters and storytellers. So I always start my talks this way. Who is in the room today? Now, generally, I'm asking, yes, <laughs> very good. Generally, I'm asking what types of people there are, developers, project managers, et cetera. But for this particular talk, I want to ask, how many people are required to give technical presentations in their job regularly? OK. All right. How many people have struggled to get their point across? Okay. All right. And then how many of you just want to learn how to be better presenters in general? OK. So I'm going to engage probably close to 90% of the audience. Those of you who don't want to do this, I do apologize. It's going to be a boring couple of 20 minutes. All right, so this talk, we're going to talk about storytelling, metaphors, humor, and a few presentation tips on delivering your story. So when we talk about storytelling, everyone has a story. And I know that sounds very NPR. Tell me your story. But I do mean it. Everyone has a story to tell. But what, what even is a story? What is a story comprised of? Help me out here. What's an element of a story? Beginning, Beginning middle, end? Conflict. Conflict, climax? Plot? Plot. Protagonist? Resolution. 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 Yeah. So we know all these different pieces, OK? So these stories, we have characters. We've got our setting. We've got a problem. We've got our complications, our resolution, our moral. We've got our plot here. And we're going to break that down for our tech talks, because some people don't know how to translate that. So when we're talking about characters, they can be real or fictional, and they can be humans or technology. Your character could be that legacy system I was talking about, about how it's loved and hated, about how people are afraid to, to explore it, because they're afraid if they type the wrong thing, something will be destroyed and lost forever. So in my story, I was talking about myself, my project team, my stoic business partner, and I was talking about this legacy system got these characters in my story. Let's talk about the setting. Now, the setting, we're talking about where, your constraints, your background. Okay. So in my story, I was talking about this large, old company that's very set in their ways, 150-year-old company. It's talking about a quiet meeting room, middle of a long project, this legacy system. And I was talking about a project manager that wasn't particularly happy to have me. I was an outsider. And that's where we get into your problem, what went wrong. Disinterested stakeholders, misunderstandings, people just don't understand. And the complications, what made it worse, the lack of my reputation, I was brand new. I was from a different field. I was an other. 
And then we talk about the resolution. What happened in the story? I learned about storytelling, I took a new strategy, and I increased my buy-in. The moral of the story is the point. So why are you even telling the story in the first place? Now, I know anytime that you've heard a story that's long and verbose and there's no point to it, you generally get pretty disappointed. It's a larger picture. So in my story, my whole point is stories resonate, stories translate. Our brains crave stories. From back when we lived in caves, that's how we communicated. That's how our oral history was passed down. We understand stories more, more than we understand facts and figures and dates and times. We remember those stories. And so if you really want to reach out to someone and get them to remember something, tell them a story about it. Give them something to hang on to. And I will say, succinct is best. It's a great way to lose an audience by boring the heck out of them. What I do is I write it out. I'll cut out all my fluff. So I write down everything about the story, and then I'll start cutting superfluous bits. I want to emphasize my tie-in. So I might have a really clever thing that I want to talk about, but if it doesn't tie back to my main story, it's just fluff. Try to get rid of it. Keep it succinct. And then I reinforce with images, because if every child will tell you, a story is better with pictures. Next, I use metaphors and similes. Everybody gets these confused. They're basically just figures of speech. Metaphors are symbolic, not literally applicable, and a simile is a comparison. Something is like something else. Metaphors translate for you. They're very, very powerful. Uh, my favorite metaphor with software development is this. You can er use a racer on the drafting table or a sledgehammer on the construction site. Now, that was written by Frank Lloyd Wright. He was an architect. He was literally talking about a racer on the paper, on the drafting table, or taking out a sledgehammer and knocking down some beams and breaking up concrete. But it's a metaphor for software engineering. We might not be knocking down walls, but when we delete code, we are burning money. Okay. So I use construction as a metaphor very often for software development because people don't seem to understand software, how it's built. The fact that it very much is analogous with a, a building, and the fact that there are pieces that you need to put together, and if you take some pieces out, the building could collapse. Okay. So when you're making metaphors, you need to zoom out to the actual process that you're looking at. Figure out what is, is, is the overall process of this thing. Make it relatable, so everybody, has everybody been in a house before? Or like an apartment or a building? Great, so everybody can relate to structures. So make sure it's relatable and use common everyday knowledge. So you wouldn't be comparing you know, software development to a very specific tie-in in Lord of the Rings, okay? Because that might not speak to everyone. But know your audience, because it might. <laughs> so let's talk about some examples that I've pulled from some of my talks. Now, if you've been to any of my talks before, these will look, some of these will look familiar. Otherwise, spoilers, I'm showing you some of my best stuff. Gosh, I don't know how I make a living. All right, so in this first one, uh, this, this comes from a talk about case studies of user experience gone wrong. So let's just kind of dive into this. So denial wins the day. They celebrated the team's firefighting efforts they had camaraderie and overtime and hot fixes, and they couldn't have predicted the outcomes. This is when they added a SAP system, sorry, didn't mean, to, an ERP system, whoopsie-daisy, into a large corporation, and they just kind of shoved it in there, put a bunch of polish on it, and shoved it out the door. They gave everybody a 10-minute training video to learn how to use this thing that was mandatory to watch, and then they said, go at it. So this is a case study about what happened. Well, why did this happen? It's because firefighters are more exciting than fire marshals. Look at her. I want to hang out with her. She could be my best friend. We'd be kicking down doors, fighting fires, and then afterwards going to the local pub. Be great. I don't want to be this guy. <laughs> Sitting behind a desk, making sure fires don't get started in the first place. This guy's lame. But here's the thing, 
You can't be the hero if you started the fire. If you're both the fire setter and the fire fighter, that is a problem. Okay. So when you look at this, you see what I did here. I gave you a, a relatable story, characters that you can relate to, firefighters and firefighting in technology. We often use that term firefighting when we're working in software that's not going well. And I'm also giving you very distinct visual imagery. I am showing you a burning building that's obviously not doing well, and I'm giving you a tagline to remember it with. So now I've given the audience something that resonates with them, something that they can take away. If they take away nothing else from my speech, they will remember, you can't be a hero if you started the fire. And maybe they'll become more fire marshals themselves. Another talk, this is a talk about empathy. I talk about listening versus perception. So I talk about ignoring, perceiving, and listening. So I like to use this metaphor. Imagine that you're driving down a road. How many people have been inside a car before? Okay, good. All right, so this might resonate with you. So you're driving down the road, and at about 300 feet ahead of you, the vehicle stops. It just lays on its brakes and just stops. What does ignoring mean in this case? Yeah, you, you don't even see it. And what happens? Yeah, you plow into them. What would perceiving be in this scenario? It works better with the talk. Noticing yep. that they've stopped? Yes, noticing they've stopped and saying, I got to get to work. What is this idiot doing? And you just like swerve around them. And then listening. What would listening be in this scenario? Maybe stopping and asking if they need help. <laughs> stopping if they ask if they need help or stopping trying to decide why would this person be stopping? Are they having a medical emergency? Is something in the road, etc.? And you see, oh, three deers start to enter the road. So with ignoring, perceiving, and listening. Ignoring means you're just not even seeing anything at all. And you will suffer the consequences whether you realize it or not. Perceiving means you realize that something is happening, but you ig completely ignore all the nuances about it. You just say how this impacts you and keep moving. And then listening is actually taking the time to figure out what is going on. So you see what I'm doing there is I'm giving you, once again, a visual indication, and I'm walking you through a story. I'm putting you in that car and asking you to make these decisions. There's also a case study view. So if you are less comfortable with pictures and you're more comfortable with reading, you can do that too. One of the techniques here is to make sure that you highlight so that people can read your key points rather than just reading for you. One of the problems with reading is once you put something up on screen that they need to read, well, they will stop listening to you, case in point. A large Fortune 150 company <laughs> created an application to replace an aging command line based legacy system. Business stakeholders agreed the legacy system should be replaced due to a heavy maintenance cost and the system's aging mainframe, and they were excited to add their input into the new system. Now, you all finished reading that about five seconds before I did, because you can read in your head a lot faster than I can, can talk. So that's just something you need to be aware of. So then what I do is I go in and I show you a mocked up version of the legacy system. We're replacing this with this. Okay, this is about 10 years ago. So. <laughs> it's beautiful at that time. So they released it. And what happened? Well, the employees largely rejected the web version. We thought they were going to be excited about it. They rejected it. You're just complaining the new system was slow, mouse-heavy, and confusing. And the UX team, my folks, we were sent to investigate what went down. So our investigation, we saw that the legacy system had many known problems, but the people were familiar with those problems. They were comfortable in that cage. The legacy system was hard to learn and had tons of memorization, and it was very unforgiving. If you typed the wrong thing, it wouldn't work, or it would do a very, very bad thing. And it was hard to recover from errors, because a lot of times you didn't even know what you did wrong. It violated four of the five usability quality components. So why do they like this thing? Well. What we also, we were so focused on what was wrong with the legacy that we neglected to look at the merits of that legacy system. 
we realized that users that were really good at it had accomplished mastery. They were really proud of what they did. They had shorthand codes, it was fast, there was no need for a mouse. And the conclusions here is it failed because we ignored everything they loved about it and we focused on everything they hated. We swung too far to the new users and we made their experts feel like we had taken their mastery away from them. All right, so that's kind of an example of using a case. You're going case by case, going through and showing you're kind of reading and it's not as, as illustrative. All right, now let's get into some humor. Humor's purpose. Why do we use humor? Anybody? To deflect from our pain? Okay, that's how I use humor. But why do we use it in tech talks? What? To keep attention, to relate? Make it memorable? Yeah. So we do it to disarm, to delight, to reinforce, to make it memorable. Okay. And it does really capture attention. But one of the things you have to do is know your audience. Who are you presenting to? It's got to be appropriate for the culture. It's got to support the material. It's got to be timely, and it can't be consistent, constant humor. So it has to be infrequent. And one thing to remember is this isn't an open mic night, okay? Unless you're at PubConf, then it is a Tech Talk open mic night. But in this case, you're not trying to just give a bunch of one-liners and make everybody laugh. You're trying to teach people something. So let's talk about timing and delivery. You want to allow for pauses. Why do we allow for pauses? Reactions. Exactly, reactions. You want the, the audience to feel like they can laugh without missing something. Like earlier, I just I stepped over your guys' laughter. That was a mistake on my part. You also need to enunciate. You enunciate and vary your speed because you want people to understand what you're saying. If they have to turn to the audience person next to them and say, sorry, what was that about? Then you've pretty much lost the humor. You also need to choose your tone carefully, watch your beats, and work on callbacks. So the types of humor, you can use stories, you can use punchlines, you can use puns. I overuse puns, you gotta be careful, some people hate puns. Uh, acronyms, memes, images, comics, swinging those in there, and callbacks. Yes, I said it twice, that was a callback. <laughs> so an example of this, uh, in this talk I call, it's called Fail Faster and I talk about failure and I ask the audience, what do you think about when you talk about failure? And they all shout a bunch of different stuff out and then I do this. Yes, you might think about punishment, shame, denial, reprisal. Basically, it's a bunch of shit you don't want to deal with. So in that case, I am using a naughty word as a thing that is humorous. Then you fast forward through the entire talk and I do a callback. So what do you do when people call your project shit? Well, you say thank you because shit is success harnessed by iteration and testing. <laughs> callback. Um, this is from that fire marshal speech, how to become a fire marshal. You can just do some really quick humor-based stuff. So it takes a plan and the willingness to change it, and then boom, I show a fire marshal, we've seen him before, boom. <laughs> that I can get behind. So um, you can also just do really quick, oops, I didn't mean to do this moments. Like, oh, we're talking about probing. Oh, 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 sorry. We put an image in there, move on, and actually get to your, your actual intent. Then giving the talk. So let's just kind of get some tips when you're actually giving the talk. I love this Mark Twain quote. I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Basically, if you don't prepare, you're gonna go long. Fortunately, we're right on time. <laughs> so some tips for you. Start on time. It's very professional to start on time. If people are late, that's it's too bad for them, right? You wanna respect the people that made it and are in your audience. Don't apologize. If you mess up, just roll with it, learn from it. Don't say sorry your entire speech. I have sat through some of the newer presenters sometimes and they apologize for every little thing because it didn't go exactly the way they thought. It's okay, don't apologize, just keep rolling. Don't just read your slides. Some people put everything they're going to say on their slides and just read them. You can do that if it makes you comfortable, but also make sure you deviate from that so you're giving them more 
more content. So they're just not very uh, reading. Vary your tone so that way you're not monotone and talking the same way the entire talk. Even though this is great to fall asleep to at night, I wouldn't recommend it during a tech talk. Use supportive movement. So I like to, if you've noticed during the talk, I like to show you different things that are in my brain by, you know, gesturing to them. But make sure you're not doing the YMCA up here. Slides are supposed to support your content, not define what you do. So if what you're talking about doesn't fit well on slides, it's okay to use props. It's okay to just have an image up and just talk. You don't need to have your slides define what you do. So to wrap this up, you want to tell your audience what you told them. So you notice at the start, I gave you an agenda and I said, this is what I'm gonna tell you. At the end, you need to say, this is what I told you. Why? Because we want that repetition and also, we have short memory spans. So I need to give you your call to action. Your call to action is simply something that I want you to remember most about this talk so that you can go do it. This is what I want you to go do after you've heard me talk. So in conclusion, everyone has a story. Write it out, then refine it. We want to be succinct as possible. Use humor wisely. Know your audience when you're using that humor. Vary your tone, vary your speed, and practice it. And leave your team, your audience, with a call to action. And my call to action is this. Never give a presentation you yourself would not want to sit through. Here's some suggested reading. I love Nancy Duarte. Slideology, Resonate, great books. And if there are any questions or feedback, I'd love to hear it. Let's chat. <laughs>